just want to welcome everyone out to uh, our family home evening uh, discussion this evening. Looking forward to another good uh, a good week's lesson or discussion. Can't don't really have any kind of announcements or anything really. So uh, with that, I'll uh, just like to welcome everyone out, and I'll pass the time over to uh, Carl to to lead the discussion this week. When I was studying, was on, on gospel principles, and quite frankly, the reason that came to me was because I kept seeing it in the assigned reading, on top of which I like, to, I like to go back over the conference talks. And one of the conference talks that I was, actually was early, early this morning when I produced this document was Elder Bednar's The Principles of My Gospel. And so that's, I chose this. And uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I had a funny thought, which I'll share with you right now based on this. Th this is a picture of me. And I hate to use examples of me. See, don't I look the same? I was just going to say, that's a nice head of hair you got there. I'm quite well, that's jealous. Exactly, exactly why I want to show you this, this picture. Because if you look at me today, and then you look at that picture, you'd say, no way, man. Anyway, so one of the things that I got when I was in my teenage year is that people would say, how do you get your hair to, to, to stay like that? I was kind of a, a wise guy when I was young. Still am. But I was a real smart aleck when I was a kid. And so I said, well, you know, I teach you correct principles and let it govern itself, which is, of course, direct theft from Joseph Smith. Our Elder Bednar goes through the history of this. And he, he talked about some years ago in Nauvoo, a gentleman in my hearing, a member of the legislature, asked Joseph Smith how it was that he was unable to govern so many people and preserve such a perfect order. And uh, remarking at the same time that it was impossible for them to do it anywhere else. Mr. Smith remarked that it was very easy to do. How, responded the gentleman, to us it's very difficult. Smith replied, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. That was his opening statement in his talk. So I had to, I, I just remember being a kid and people asking me if I, you know, did I use hairspray or whatever? And no, I didn't. I just always had my hair like that and it stayed the same. I thought I would uh, open that up with uh, talking about gospel principles. And the idea here that in the 1830s, when the church was restored, we look at it back 200 years and we can say, oh yeah, yeah, tick that box, tick that box. And then came this, then came that. But in reality, they were kind of walking blind. They didn't really know what was gonna happen next. The Lord was just kind of leading them and guiding them. And they just walked forward with a bunch of faith. You know, when, when Joseph Smith was, in the, was in, the, in the grove of trees and he prayed, the Lord didn't just dump everything on him and say, okay, what we're going to do here is we're going to have the first vision. Then you're going to get the Book of Mormon. Then you're going to get the priesthood. Then we're going to restore the church. And then all the Aaronic and Melchizedek, like he didn't do that. He first said, do you remember? What was he really looking for? What did the Lord really tell him? Why did he go to the grove? Well, he told him not to join any of the churches. Yeah. And why was that important to Joseph? Well, that was one of the questions he had. The other question he had was, what, what was his standing with the Lord? Exactly. That's exactly right. And when you talk about the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's really the context behind the whole restoration. He had faith in God. I remember reading um, Lucy Mack Smith's, some of the things that she wrote. She was a, an excellent writer. And she, she said that Joseph was not really given to reading and writing. In fact, his wife said that he couldn't even pen a decent letter, if you remember correctly. He couldn't put two thoughts together. And his penmanship was horrid. And he just wasn't that, that wasn't his thing. But his mother said he was given to very, very deep thinking. And as a 12-year-old, now imagine your 12-year-olds. You know, I, when I think about my 12-year-olds, were any of them really worried about their standing before God? And so this concept that, that Joseph had faith in God and that he was worried about repenting precipitated the whole first vision. And from there, then his next question was, okay, I, I know now God lives and I've met him. So what church do I join? And then he found out that there wasn't a place for him to join, that he should join none of them. And I don't think it ever entered into his head. Oh, okay, well, I'm the one that's, that's going to restore the church. That just wasn't there. 
I always find I find that an interesting question. Uh, like when you when you talk about you know think about when you were twelve years old, or think about some of the deacons in the ward and kind of where their heads are at, um, and compare that to to Joseph Smith. I like I I always I was actually a, a very pensive as a kid. I thought a lot about things. Um, I was generally a little more quiet and, and I did, I was, I would consider myself a very aware of, of, you know, or concerned with my standing with God. I remember thinking about that quite a bit. And so I always, when I think about this, I'm like, well, you know, how come I, how come I wasn't chosen or, you know, like, why didn't I get, you know, more of these big experiences or things like that? Or how was I different or how was, Joseph Smith, you know, different than me, because a lot of us just kind of focus on this, uh, you know, you know, he, his mindset was so unique. Um, and when I think about it, um, what really sets, I think, in my opinion, or based on my observation and reading is what sets Joseph Smith apart from someone like myself or others that were still very pensive and, you know, aware of where they were. Uh, so first off, I was raised in the church, so I knew everything that I needed to be doing, and I knew exactly what my steps were going to be over the next, you know, a couple of years. My plan was very set out for me. If in that moment I would have received some sort of prompting, I don't think I would have had the faith to do it or to to stand up for, you know, these these new thoughts like you were saying a little bit Carl is you know like they didn't know what was going to happen everything was so new for them and I can only imagine what it was like for Joseph Smith at this time as a kid as some would say crazy ideas about you know what's happening or what he should be doing I would have I would have never been able to do that so that's that's the big contrast that I see uh, between you know most of us growing up um, at that age is, you know, the, the faith that he had to actually stand up for what he was, uh, what he was believing in and what, uh, you know, the things that he had seen and heard. Um, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do that, even though I was, I had, I would say I had a lot of faith and I was very aware of, um, kind of my mis like kind of where I was, uh, with God and had a good relationship at that point in my life. I think that he just took it to a next level, right. With the whole, concept of faith and his his ability to stand up for I, I hear what you're saying because you know we if you were to graph our progress we tend to go like this right yeah it's a slow incline up but uh, Joseph did things differently like if you if you look at the 116 stolen or lost pages he kind of went like this and then straight back up because he said I learned from that that if the Lord commands, then just do it. Don't question it. He had this unique ability, whereas our life is more wavy. His was once, you know, he still made mistakes, but the incline after his mistakes because of that resolve that you were talking about was totally different. So, and so as he accepted these different principles that the Lord was trying to teach him, it's not like it, like us, you know, like, two steps forward, one step back. It was like five step forward, one back, 10 steps forward, one back. And so the rate of increase was just phenomenal in what he was able to do. And it's like Joseph's ability to attract light, to consume it and to understand it and to move to the next level. His intelligence in that sense, I think is what you're saying, was far in advance of ours. We're just slower learners. He was able to attract that intelligence, that light, that truth, and stay on that path and just move so much faster. And and which is crazy. What's crazy to think is, I mean, we're such we're so much slower in in our progression and, and our ability to learn, despite having the path set out for us. We know exactly what we should be doing. We have so many examples of what we should be doing. Whereas he didn't have that, and he was still able to grow at that. And maybe that's why you know kind of pushed a little more but oh yeah. well although i mean i i mean his learning experiences were at a different level than certainly the ones that i'm i had i mean you mentioned the experience of the lost manuscript plates i mean the, the, i think the biggest principle he learned there was fear god more than fearing man well 
how many times have I had to relearn that principle, but I didn't go through an experience where, you know, the, the golden plates were taken away from me by an angel and it's like, you're smart smarten up, you're never get this back. Yeah. You know, he, he, I can see him straighten out a lot quicker than certainly I did. It was like a crash course. He had to go through it quickly. Yeah. And, and 200 years ago, it was a different time period. I think it, it, I, I know, I can testify that we're all selected for our particular time periods. Okay, we're here now because of specific skills, specific needs that we have. We're in our particular circumstances based on specific choices that we made. And it all adds up like there's this huge giant puzzle and the Lord's piecing it all together and we're all placed in our certain time. The, the other thing is that don't underestimate Joseph's background. There are all kinds of stories of his grandfather who had these visions that that something powerful was going to happen in his family line. Uh, amazing things were going to happen. Look at his mother, Lucy Mack. She was a dynamo. She was like four foot ten or four foot eleven, like under five feet, and she was just a fireball. I was reading some of the stories this week, um, and you're all f- familiar with the one where there's the three companies of the saints and they're all trapped in Buffalo and they can't get out. They're all taking ships. They can't get out because of the ice, right? The ice has blocked them in. The ice is frozen. And so uh, I was reading one where Lucy was, was coming back to the ship and she was trying to arrange some different things. And she met Thomas B. Marsh, who would then become eventually of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the, the head apostle. And, and, she, and she was going to get on the, the ship and start a meeting or something. And he said to her, Mother Smith, you're, you're, you're not going to sing and pray and announce to the world that, that we're members of the church. Because if you do that, we're never going to get out of here. We're going to get mobbed. I mean, it's going to get ugly really fast. And she looked at him and said, you know, bring on the mobs. We, we have to do this. We have to tell people who we are and what we believe. There's no way around it. And so she's getting onto the ship, the laurels, the laurel age girls are kind of flirting with uh, all the men on the boat. And she just rains fire and brimstone on them and telling them to rein it in. You can't be putting on your flirt right now. We are members of the church. We're saints. We've got to demonstrate to the world that we're different from everybody else. And then, so she goes ahead and then she's, she starts singing and starting the meeting. And as somebody in the, in the crowd in the background yells, is the Book of Mormon true? You know, they're heckling her. And she turns to them and bears this solid testimony of the Book of Mormon and the truth of it and the principles that it teaches. And then she starts wailing on the members of the church. She says, you know, if you guys had the faith, we could all pray together right now just think about it. We all pray for the Lord's help right now. And he could break this ice open and we could get out of here and move on to where we're going to Kirkland. And then there's this huge crack sound. The ice splits apart and two ships get out. Her ship and one other ship. And then the ice closes back on. That's a very famous story. But what I learned this week, that's the end of that story, is that the crowd were saying, oh, they're never going to make it. That ship is going to sink. Look, it's even riding lower in the water than it should be right now. And so they immediately went to the newspaper and announced to them that that ship was never going to make it. So when they land further down the lake to get off, they read in the newspaper of their own deaths. They were so sure that that ship wasn't going to make it. They announced it to the newspaper who printed it that they sank. And so this was the kind of faith that his mother had. The, the circumstances that they were in were very, very different from our day today. I just think it's, it's amazing to me what he was able to endure and what, what they were able to endure. On the other hand, I'm sure that they're looking down at us and saying, yeah, we walked 300 miles. We walked 900 miles. We walked 1,500 miles. Yeah, we wore out our shoes. And yeah, some of us died. But you guys in 2021... What's with the advertising, the constant barrage, the evilness that is in the world? Like 200 years ago, if you wanted to, to see evil and be part of evil, you had to actively seek it out. But you don't have to do that anymore. It just comes pouring into the house. You got to plug all the holes so that the evil doesn't come in. 
And so we're, we're in a different time. But the principles of the gospel are still the same. Anyway, this talk, I have to highly recommend it. This talk from Elder Bednar, the principles of my gospel from this last general conference. And he goes through and he, and he teaches all kinds of very interesting things about how the brethren try to teach us principles. In the old days, if you go all the way back to Moses, you got lists of things you should do and you should not do. And he says, we're not doing that anymore. We're just going to teach him correct principles. Dallin H. Oak spoke in General Conference in 1998. And he described the principle of non-distraction. And this was aimed at the Aaronic priesthood. The, the, his rationale behind doing this was he wanted the Aaronic priesthood when they were administering the emblems of the sacrament to not distract from it because of their appearance, because of their attitude, because of how they did it. He wanted them, the people who were being administered the sacrament to, to spend their whole mental energy on the sacrament and the Savior and the Lord. Make sure that when you present yourself, he did not provide the young men a lengthy list of things to do and not do, but rather he explained the principle with the expectation that the young men and their parents and teachers could and should use their own judgment and inspiration to follow the guidelines. I will not suggest to you detailed rules, since the circumstances in various wards throughout the world will be different. Rather, I will suggest to you a principle. And the principle he taught is make sure your attire, your hair, what you look like, how you act, will not distract from the sacrament. So that when people partake of the sacrament, they won't be distracted because of who's administering it. And I thought that's, that's what Joseph Smith was getting at when he said, I teach them correct principles. And then he goes on to, to explain all kinds of different things that the, that the brethren are trying to teach us after 200 years about the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once you know the principles, then you don't need the detailed rule because your mind just figures it out itself. Or I heard a bunch of other stories that I, I feel impressed to, to relate to. There was one story I heard this week about a sister who went on a mission to Italy. And of course, I, I perked her up right away because I served my mission mm -hmm. in Italy. And so she's come back off of her mission or during her mission even, she was writing to her brother, who at the same time was serving a mission in South America. And he was talking about how he had, there were so many baptisms that were happening. And, and I can relate to this because one of my boys served in Africa. And on the 15th of the month, usually, they had to set um, a quota, no more baptisms, because we've got too many baptisms. That's, that's what I call a happy problem, right? got too many baptisms the growth is too exponential we're closing off the fonts for two weeks till the new month and then she was thinking i served 18 months and i never got one baptism so what goes through your mind as a missionary going out doing the same things every day that your brother is doing in south america and he's got so many baptisms he can't even remember them all and she doesn't get any and then what does that teach what principle are we learning there i'll share with you what she finally discovered over 18 months. It was a very difficult principle for her to understand. She said, it's not about the outcome, it's about the development. So what she needed to learn, she learned on her mission, and what he needed to learn, he learned on his mission. And whether there were baptisms or not, are almost, I'm gonna say almost, not relevant. They're like a cream, a bonus. But the real development was in the individual person. And then it reminded me of something that I heard and I had to search it out. It was something that was said by Mother Teresa. We are not called to be successful, but faithful. And I think that's in our reading this week in sections 51 through 57. That's a lot of what is happening here. Oh, sorry. I was just going to, I was going to say that, that story of a brother and sister were seeing different types of success on their mission. That, that rings really true to me. I, like, so I served in Mexico, Mexico City East, and it, like a year or two after it was the highest baptizing mission in the world. And so um, while I was there, I still, we, we saw really high numbers in baptisms. And I remember, so like we had uh, 
as a mission, set the goal to baptize at least one person per companionship every week. And I didn't see very many. And this sounds really bad, but um, I, I only baptized around just under 20, which is, which is I, like I shouldn't complain about. But I remember at the time being very, I would say, disappointed and almost like embarrassed to some extent, like uh, everyone else around me was baptizing so many. And I was like, you know, I'm working just as hard, if not harder. You know, why am I not seeing the same results as these others? And it took me a long time to, to figure out what was going on. And, and uh, after a lot of reflection, you know, another side of my mission that, uh, that most people didn't see was I was very, very consistently paired up with problematic elders the emergency transfers oh. all the time. And I remember being like, you know, like, why, like, why, 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 why is this all happening? And then, you know, after, after coming home from my mission, a lot more reflection, I see that my, the purpose behind my mission was a little different than a lot of others. Um, and I was just, you know, placed in this really hard environment where it looked like I wasn't a successful missionaries to some elders. And I used to get like, I used to get people that thought poorly of me because they thought that I was a lazy missionary because I was only baptizing. had 20 baptisms. Yeah. I know, which was crazy. But then again, it's like, and so that was really hard on, on me, but in hindsight, I can see that kind of like what you were saying is what I thought was success um, was, was different um, than, than what actually was, that was the success that I was seeing. You know, my mission wasn't necessarily to bring uh, these new converts in, but it was more so focused on bringing these elders that were struggling uh, closer to, uh, you know, giving them good experience for their missions and good experiences to bring home to their family. That, that's a really interesting um, discussion because uh, I had 17 companions on my mission. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was uh, up there too. I was over over 12 or yeah i had 17 companions and i had one companion that was awesome mm -hmm. totally awesome but only for seven days <laughs> uh, and then yeah. the rest not so much I, when i was on a mission uh, not to go into a lot of detail of my experience but i remember always feeling like and a lot of people were saying you know the two years of your mission is kind of like a mirror of the, your life and, and actually, I, and I think what we're talking about here is true if, with our lives outside of our missions. It, it, is, it is difficult if we're going to judge our success based on other people's successes because mm -hmm. everything is all different. And, and I think, and I, I, liked, I like your point, Carl, that, that it's about development, yeah. not the results. And, and I think that's really true. And I, you know, for missions, absolutely, even more so for life before and after missions, uh, families, marriages, careers, you know, we, that's why, that's why it's so dangerous to compare ourselves with other people. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why we need to have our own person, I think our own personal revelation channel through the Holy Ghost of what we're supposed to be doing, what we're supposed to be developing and what we're supposed to be trying to achieve and, and not even judge ourselves about our results. Uh, really, that comes back to the principle that I learned a long time ago. I think I mentioned this last week, and that is it's more about who we become yeah. uh, through this mm -hmm. life, not what we accomplish or any of the results or anything like that. I want to talk about Zion for a minute <laughs> and building Zion. And uh, this doctrine comments 51 through 57 is really focused on this because, and there's a whole preamble that I could do this could take hours. But if you go through the Book of Mormon it, and you go through the previous dispensations all the way back to the Jaredites, even though the society is crashing around them, Jared is saying, yeah, but in the last days, Zion will be built. You know, and we eventually win. And then as the Nephite structure is all crashing down on them, Mormon and Moroni are also, they spend some time talking about the new Jerusalem and Zion that's going to come forth. And in the end, we're going to win. And even when Jesus Christ visits them <clears throat> after the massive destruction um, in third Nephi, he talks about the new Jerusalem and Zion that's going to come. So as just imagine you're a brand new convert to the church. The church is not even a year, just a year old, and you're reading the Book of Mormon. You're hungrily devouring it, and it's talking about the new Jerusalem. It's talking about Zion and establishing. So this is really on their mind. And so as they saints are moving from New York 
to Ohio, which is the period that we're in right now, they've got this, is Ohio going to be Zion? Is that Zion? Is that what we're going to, and the Lord talks about planting them in there and, and putting them in and, and, you know, if in retrospect, when we look at it after living the history and we can see the subtitles under there, they're saying, this is only for a little season, you know, you're going to be uprooted and you're going to be planted in Missouri. Then you're going to be uprooted and you're going to go to Nauvoo. Then you're going to be uprooted and you're going to be out in Salt Lake city. Like we know that, but they didn't know that. And the Lord didn't really tell them. In fact, in section 52, they go to a general conference and they're all got the Zion on the mind. Where's Zion going to be? What's it's going to be? And then he announces that the next, the next conference, this is in June 31, the next conference is going to be in Missouri and go there. And then I'll tell you more. There's this little, it gives you a little breadcrumbs. And so then, you know, by the time you get to section 57, then he says, okay, Zion's in independence. It's in Missouri. It's out by the Lamanites. And then everybody's like, that's where Zion is. And I feel for, for example, the Colesville Saints, who uproot from New York. They land over in Ohio. Uh, Brother Copley says, come and stay on my land. And then he kicks them off because he decides that it's not for him. And not only does he kick all of the Kirkland or all of the Saints off from that one area in New York, he says, and because you've used my land, I'm going to charge you 60 bucks. So they had planted themselves and the lord had told them as it's as if you're you know you need, you need to act as if you're going to be here forever and so they do and they they build buildings and they build fences and they plant crops then they get kicked off and have the pleasure of paying for that service that they give and then they get transported to missouri and next week we'll talk about you know what happened well on sunday we'll talk about what happens in missouri because they get to missouri and they're thinking like it's zion independence is this small little two horse town full of the dregs of society. One of the articles that I was reading talked about how every other establishment was either a brothel or a place to get booze. It was the and, frontier. Yeah, it was the frontier. And yeah. in those days, if you had something against the law, you went to the frontier. Divorce wasn't common. So if you didn't like your family situation, you went to the frontier because they'll never find you. There was rampant land speculation People trying to do my, it was a just, it was a terrible place. It was a nasty place. The missionary, the super team missionary that had done such great things in Kirkland had got there and hit a brick wall. Nothing. They weren't allowed to teach to the Lamanites. So they tried to teach to this hardcore group of individuals that just didn't really want to have anything to do with religion, who could barely tolerate the law. And so when the saints start arriving in Zion, saying, this is the promised land, this is the place where everything's going to, it just crashes and burns. It doesn't work. Somebody's got to build Zion. Zion still has to be built. Zion is still an independence. Who's going to build it? Because it's not just going to magically happen. It needs to be built. Zion needs to be built in Calgary. It needs to be built in my house, in my ward, in my stake. We need to build Zion. And so we have this unfolding restoration that's happening. We have these general conferences every twice a year. And I'm going to segue into that for just a minute because there's a talk here. At the end of the talk from Brother Bednar, he says this. President Ezra Taft Benson taught, for the next six months, your conference edition of the Enzyme, well, the Leona now, should stand next to your standard works and be frequent and be referred to frequently. With all the energy of my soul, I invite all of us to learn, to live, and love principles of righteousness. Only gospel truths can enable us to cheerfully do all the things that lie in our power, to press forward on the covenant path, and to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed. And that's really what has to happen for us to build Zion. We get our marching orders every six months at conference. The Lord is inspires the leaders of the church to tell us what we should be working on what's next in this process of building zion one brick at a time you know you can say it different ways uh the president of the church said you know whether it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're teaching the gospel if you're teaching your kids if you're showing a good example whether it's on this side of the veil or on the other side of the veil we are gathering israel and building zion that's what we're doing
Just add one thing in there. I like the principle that's also taught in that uh, section about how the temple is a key part of building Zion, especially living so close to the temple. Just, just wanted to throw that in there. Very, very, and, very. And it's, and it's been such, of course, I remember well before the temple was in Calgary, before the one was in Edmonton. It's been such a blessing, even in my own personal life. But uh, I know to certainly to the lives of Calgarians, both in the church and out of the church, having that temple here. So, yeah. Amazing, especially for those people on the other side of the veil that yeah, are just waiting. Yeah. And I'm sure they're equally frustrated with this whole COVID thing because they're all like, oh, come on. I was next on the list. I was getting, I was, you know, in the top 10, I was getting up there. And now the whole thing comes crashing down. And as an aside from that, I wonder how many of us really understand how impactful it is to have a temple in our midst, how much it impacts our lives. And maybe this taking it away for a season will kind of smarten us up. It, it certainly wasn't as busy as it could have been. No. And, and so let's, let's hopefully smarten us up. Yes. And, and obviously the Lord has some other plans because he just announced 20, well, 21 now, I guess, because there was another one afterwards that was announced. So 21 in the space, you know, it used to be you get one or two every once in a while. Then you got two or three and then four or five. Then they got up to eight. Now they're at 20. They're announcing 20. Crazy. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do. So, you know, if we're, we're, if we're praying thy kingdom come, my question is, what are we doing to make it come? And so the pattern that's discussed in the scriptures this week is how to distinguish the messenger to make sure it's an adequate messenger. So now we've talked about the, the doctrine whether it's correct or not. We've talked about personal revelation, how to discern that. And then the pattern that it was established in this week, which we can't really go into, talks about the messenger and how you can discern whether or not the messenger is coming from the right pattern. Anyway, having said all that, I'll turn it back over to Jess. Um, again, thanks, Carl and Rod, for your contributions this week. I think it was a great discussion and I definitely got some good stuff out of it. So hopefully the the word can, um, or others can, can listen in, uh, and, and get something out of this too, or, uh, sparks of new thoughts. Um,